Well, good evening, everybody. This is Gary Markham, and I'm along with Rick Ganelli and Nola Jones. And welcome to the next um, music administrative collaborative session that we're having monthly. And uh, I can't think of a better presenter than Scott Edgar, who we have here tonight. A um, lot going on in the country, a lot going on in our profession. And so he's got some great advice. And so, uh, Scott, please welcome and come along and have at it with our attendees. Gary, thank you, my friend. It is such an honor. And, you know, I'm going to be very honest with everybody. Two hours ago, I texted Nola and said, are we still going to do this thing? Uh, today has been a day. And I'm just going to start off by letting you know I'm not okay. Today has punched me in the gut. And in our world these days, it seems like we have so many gut punches. The second that we feel like we're standing up for a second, bam, right? And we get knocked down again. Today hit me hard and for a lot of different reasons. So what we're going to talk about today, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. You know, I had a, a typical talk where I'm going to talk to music and fine arts administrators about how do we integrate social and emotional learning, professional development for our teachers. And then the world happened. And here's what I was going to talk about. And I totally rewrote everything that we're going to talk. So I do ask for just a little bit of indulgence uh, as we start to talk about this, because, you know, talking about SEL 101 and talking about history in theory, folks, you don't want to hear that today. We have too many things that we are bringing into this call. We have too many things that we're weighing on our shoulders, that for us to unpack some of those things right now, we're not in the headspace. Because when the human brain is in trauma, when it's in, in anxiety, when we are encountering stress, as many of us are right now today, we're not able to listen. We're not able to approach our typical logical brain with the ability that we are when we're in a non-anxiety, in a non-trauma space. And let's just own it. Today's been traumatic as a country, as a world, as individuals. You know, so the big question that I asked myself was, what, what am I going to say? Well, how am I going to frame this puppy in a way that's going to be meaningful, that's going to be something that we're going to all be able to navigate and wrap our heads around this? So I got to work and I had to tell myself that I'm not going to be afraid to tackle this puppy head on, that I'm not going to be afraid to tackle very, very sensitive issues, that I'm not going to be afraid to present in a space where we need to talk about things. You know, there's a very good reason why conversations around religion, politics, for example, don't go well. And it's because from a very young age, We've been told not to talk about religion and politics. So why do we have any question that when we try to do it, it doesn't go well? Well, because we've been told to ignore it. We've been told to avoid it. And that's one of the really important things to wrap our heads around to realize why we are where we are right now. We can't be afraid to talk about things that might challenge us, to talk about things that might go against the beliefs of others, to embrace our commonalities, but to explore our differences. So we're going to engage really quickly in what I call a waterfall. We're going to, uh, so it's a waterfall. It's a technique that many of your teachers could use, and uh, some of you may be familiar with it. So I'm going to ask you to type something into the chat, but do not press send until I ask you to do so. So you're going to type, 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 but don't press return or the right arrow button until I ask you to do so, okay? So here we go. And um, the question that I want you to answer is, what is one word, one word for you to describe today? So in the chat, please type that word, but don't press send yet. I'll give you about 20 seconds. One word to describe today for you. Don't press send yet. Hopefully that word is coming to you. Okay, we're going to press send in five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, engage. 
Make sure we're sending it to everybody. I see Ricks. I see Gary. Chaotic, concerning, helpless, anxiety, challenging. Yep. Disappointment. Turmoil. Sad. Great. And, and, and thank you. Just found out that there's a 10 second delay. So five, four, three, two, one quickly became 15, 14. So, so thank you for that. Disheartening, unreal, challenging, turmoil. Brian, you write hopeful. Thank you for that. Horrifying. Absolutely. Thank you for this. It is so important for us to wrap our heads around the current state, for us to be able to feel like no matter how we are feeling, that our emotions are validated. You know, one of my favorite movies is Inside Out. You know, there's five core emotions and we start off all, you know, saying, yes, let's be joyful. But you know what? There's moments that we're not happy and that's okay. It's okay to not be happy. There's moments when we need to be sad, when we need to be angry, when we need to be disgusted. <clears throat> we need to feel that freedom as administrators. We need to feel that freedom as teachers. And we certainly need to facilitate spaces where we can facilitate that for our students. So the question that I'm gonna pose for you now is I want you to put yourself in my shoes. How would you handle this discussion how would you handle this type of interaction if you had professional development with your teachers on a day like today? How would you provide guidance for your teachers to engage with your students on a day like today? And I'm going to go back to when I was a very young teacher, and I'm going to show my age, and some of you are going to say whippersnapper. 9-11, uh, we were explicitly told to not talk about it. We were explicitly told to understand that we are not to talk about this as teachers. We are not to engage with our students as part of that discussion. When we look at it from that perspective, well, then we have a lot of challenges because we're ignoring things. We're sweeping things under the rug. There are two big ideas that I wanna throw at you right now. One is called the essential conversation. And if you're looking for the theory behind it, it comes to us from Nell Donnings, who believes in the ethics of care. How can we care for each other? And the essential conversation are the conversations that we need to have in our classroom. The conversation that our students are just thirsting for in our classrooms, but sometimes we're afraid to have. We need to have the courage to have essential conversations because they're having them outside of our classrooms. How can we do so in our classrooms? Essential conversations. The second one is constructive controversy. Constructive controversy is how do we facilitate the conversations that might be dicey, that might have disagreement, because inherently disagreement is not bad. We've been taught that if I disagree with you, I have to hate you. And that is not the world. Now, the challenge that we're seeing right now, especially in our world, is that so many of our beliefs are so dichotomous are so on opposite ends of a spectrum. Now, one thing that I'm gonna challenge you to think about when we start to talk about these conversations is that it does take courage. And as I was watching the television today, I heard people, and I, I'm not gonna get too political, but I heard people from both sides of the aisle come together and talk with the same language. And that's the first time I've heard that in a very long time. I've heard people who prior to today had very, very differing dialogue, dialogues, very different narratives. And today brought that spectrum a little bit around like this for us to understand that the more different we are, really the more the same we are and we still have the same insides and we need to understand what that looks like. You know, as I was watching TV today, there was something that I was trying to wrap my head around. How do I understand this humanity? How do I understand what we're looking at? <clears throat> and I go back to one of my heroes, who is Mr. Rogers. And Mr. Rogers had this to say, every single person that you see, whether they're doing good, bad, and understanding that that's subjective based upon your worldview, but they were all children once, and they all had teachers, and they all had mommies, and they all had people who helped guide them through those formative years. Every single person that we see in this world 
was an infant once. If we think about it from that perspective, for just a second, it gives us space to try to understand, even when our hearts are in such turmoil, when we see things that just rip us from shred to shred. So I'm gonna use that as an entry point to get us to SEL. You know, today was all about SEL and how we can start talking about that, getting it into your programs and getting it into your districts. But like I said, that's not where we're gonna end up having to take this. But I am going to tell us a little bit about the nuts and bolts uh, around SEL to help us wrap our heads around the events of today. So when we look at social and emotional learning, and my guess is you are getting this just inundated from the districts, from the states, from our, you know, NAFME, everyone is saying that, you know, SEL is an important thing. But when it comes down to it, SEL is three very, very simple things. Self, others, decisions. Who am I? How do I get along with others? And how do I make responsible decisions? Now, the problem with that is that the dialogue, the narrative that we're hearing right now, we're skipping to the end. We're saying, why are these decisions happening? Why is this the reality that we're looking at? Why are these the decisions that certain people are making? Well, it's sequential. So I can't even start to sniff at decisions until I understand others. And I can't understand others until I become self-aware. So if you go start spouting self-others decisions, they're going to say, oh, you talked to Scott Edgar and he gave you an SEL clinic. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to give you some different words. Identity, belonging, agency. Right now, we're talking about agency. How can my voice make a difference? You know, the national dialogue right now is about equity. How can we truly embrace equity? And we can't ignore that. But belonging, so much of what we're looking at right now is because people are struggling to belong. People are struggling to have a space where they feel safe. So all of that is essential. But the reason that we're struggling with it mightily right now is because we're skipping an inherent step, and that's identity. Who are you? Who am I? And what has formed my beliefs that are being put out there on stage today? So I can't talk about belonging until I talk about identity. I need to unpack who I am and why I believe the way that I do. And if I can't answer that question, then I'm in trouble. Then I am trying to put so many carts before so many horses. And that's where SEL can help our teachers. Can our teachers understand what is part of their identity? What is part of their musical identity? What is part of their interpersonal identity? Our students need to be on this journey. They need to understand that the world that they're seeing out there has people in it who have identities. And we need to understand what is at the root of those identities. When we start to think about those beliefs and start to understand that, then we can start to get ourselves into this idea of belonging and inclusiveness and understanding that equity matters and that we can provide a space where we can all feel space, uh, safe to differ. So, you know, uh, Today, you know, it was all about flexibility for me. It was all about saying, you know, this thing that I was planning on talking about is not going to be relevant for us right now. That's not the, what's going to serve us collectively the best. I had to be flexible. <clears throat> so the first thing that I'm going to suggest uh, is that we need to be flexible as teachers, that we need to be flexible as administrators, that we need to provide space for our teachers to feel comfortable to have those essential conversations, to have that constructive controversy where we can embrace those. Now, you know, I'm all about having these conversations, but I'm going to be honest with you. That's what's wrong with how social and emotional learning is being implemented in schools today. It's being relegated as an advisory period, as homeroom, as something that is divorced from content. You know what? We have the greatest gift in the world, and that is music. How can we use music as a portal to have these conversations? And the answer is plentiful. And I stole that portal, by the way, by, uh, from, um, from Alex Shapiro, composer. Uh, and she said that social and emotional learning is a portal inward towards our hearts and a portal outward to the world around us. We have the gift of emotional and social 
music. Our composers have given us the clay. Can we use that as entry points to have these conversations? I don't expect you or your teachers to go in and say, let's just talk about this. Sometimes that's appropriate, but sometimes we haven't developed the trust. We haven't developed the capacity to be able to sit down and have those conversations. So we need to provide an organic, organic entry point. And that entry point is the music. So, um, you know, today for me, today for me, everything that we watched and all the emotions that we're feeling right now, it was a justification for the need for social and emotional learning. Do we have the skill set to respond to challenges instead of react? Today showed so many reactions. It was bam, and it became so fast. Response takes skill. Recovering from this takes skill. And we all agree that music is a space for unity. If one person's playing out of tempo, it's not gonna work, right? Absolutely. We need to be able to come together and build social and emotional musical skills. Those are two trains running together. You know, Scott Rush says, we're in the people business and we're in the music business. You can't have one without the other. It works best when we put them together. That's what we're talking about today. So I'm going to leave you with just one idea, and then we're going to uh, open up some space to be able to talk about this, because my guess is there are a lot of questions uh, that are going to build from this. Do know that coming up here, and I know Nola is going to uh, introduce this at the very end, <laughs> on the 23rd of this month, I'm going to talk more about the nuts and bolts of SEL when we're in a space, hopefully, that we can really wrap our heads around what does this look like, how do we do it, what are the activities, and how can we really get that competency building, uh, getting some momentum in our classroom and the professional development for our teachers. But for right now, for right now, I'm going to leave you with this. Needs before notes, that our students don't need to say, okay, I'm at grade four rep. This is the time for me to go to grade five. You know, they've they're going to come into classrooms with the weight that we're bringing in today and just how we're not all ready to be locked into what I'm talking about today. They have so much going on in their lives right now, and they are acutely aware of it. We have a four-year-old in our house, and Nathan is, a he doesn't have the same language that we have, and we've shielded him from a lot of things, but he knows there's a pandemic. He knows that there are a lot of things right now that are preventing him from being able to do things that he wants to do. The first thing that we need to do is to be able to tell our teachers that it's okay to put needs before notes. It's okay to prioritize that our kids have to come first. We'll get back to the notes. We'll get back to that. But I'm hoping that moving forward into our new post-pandemic reality, that we're gonna be able to fold that deck just a little bit so that we're able to take our students' needs and understand how we can truly capitalize on the benefits of our music classroom to meet our students' social and emotional needs while we're meeting their musical needs. <clears throat> you know, there were a lot of people doing a lot of talking right uh, today. And um, without getting partisan, without getting political, I'm just going to highlight a couple of key words that I heard that struck with me today that I think represent our call to action, no matter what your political beliefs are, no matter what side you're on. President-elect Biden said, step up. Yes, that was in reference to a certain person, but I believe that our call as music educators is to step up, that we need to have the courage to have those essential conversations, to have that constructive controversy, to understand that if we're doing a piece of music that inherently tackles issues such as racism or sexism, that we don't sweep that under the carpet, that we embrace that and have those difficult conversations. Van Jones had this to say, is this the beginning or the end of something? And you know, that was a scary question that he posed today. And when I heard him say that, I thought, well, you know what? We have a choice. That decision has not been made, whether this is the beginning or the end of something. Your role as music uh, supervisors is to mentor the mentors. We need to realize that our music classrooms are a space, are a space that we have an opportunity to not only teach music, but to help build social and emotional competency so that we understand that the violence that we saw today is the end of something and not 
the beginning of something that's going to get much, much worse. We have a choice if we choose to tackle it. Thank you very much. Nola, back to you. I just need to take a minute, Scott. <laughs> I'm kind of where you are, and, and, and your message really touched me personally and, and uh, just, I think, reminded us all, um, you know, contrary to by this time people start dropping off, we have more people than we did when we started. So everybody who was here stayed with us and more people joined us. And I think that's an indicator that we needed to hear what you had to say and that we all needed to be together tonight as people to to reinvest in our mission and, and why we're doing what we're doing. Um, what we're seeing, I, I, I talked to a lot of administrators. I know you all talk to each other, but I have the great opportunity to talk to people all across the country. And what I'm hearing is that arts administrators are feeling pressure from all sides. It's coming from the top, it's coming from the people we serve, and it's coming from the outside in. And you're just, you're, you're carrying a lot. And so Scott, I don't know, they say the higher power takes care of children and fools and alcoholics, <laughs> reprobates, whatever. But whatever caused you to be here tonight, the men and the stars in the line, and we're really, really grateful to have you. <laughs> Thank you. And you know, Nola, I'm I, I'm going to tell you, and you got to trust me, it's T. Uh, but you know, hundred percent, hundred percent. And you know what? <laughs> uh, what's really interesting, Nola, is that. You know, the higher you get up the mountain, the thinner the air is. And no one's asking, no one's asking how our administrators are doing. And our administrators are being put into so many tough positions right now to make decisions. And no matter what decision you make, it's not going to be popular. There's going to be some people that you're going to tick off. And for us to be able to be self-aware and to say, to understand that that is not a judgment on us, but to be able to be a little bit vulnerable and say, you know what, here we go. I have to make tough decisions. And when we talk about SEO, and I'll talk about more of this on the 23rd, and as we start to talk about how do we navigate, you know, some of these difficult conversations that we're, we're having to have, you know, can we position ourselves to encourage our teachers to be empathetic followers? You know, we're leaders, they're leaders, and our students, we're trying to teach leaders, but it's all about modeling. For us as administrators, you know, we're at the top, and granted, we have people who are higher up, uh, at the district level often, but are we able to position ourselves to say, you know what, here were my choices and here's why I made the decision that I did and encourage our teachers to be empathetic followers, to help to understand the position. And that's teaching them to be leaders because we all know that this journey for leadership and social and emotional learning isn't finite. It doesn't stop when we become an administrator or a teacher. It's a lifelong journey. Trust me, we know so many adults who don't have these skills. <clears throat> so if we're expecting our teachers to teach these skills, we have to model it for them, for them to model it for our students. And it really does come down to empathy and vulnerability. Well, and we know that we all aspire to be educational leaders, but you, I think many of us start out as, as administrators and we learn to be educational leaders and then we learn to be better educational leaders. You know, it's, it's a process and so many times it's not linear. Um, so I'm hoping that, that you will uh, enter into the chat and, and have some questions for Scott. Um, Scott, if you, can I, can I start? Can I ask the first one? hundred percent, of course. <laughs> So Scott, if you if you were a fine arts administrator and you wanted to communicate with your teachers tomorrow, whether it's an email or a Zoom call or whatever, what would you leave with? You, you know, um, and, and I'm going to take an easy way out because I think Jason said it beautifully. I think we get trapped in partisanship. I think we get trapped in politics and I think we get trapped in confusing some of the challenges that we're having right now as being uh, more. Hmm, more more political than they are and to base it in humanity to base it in human values to base it in human development and understanding some of those core values i go back to you know just two rock stars in my life right now are mr rogers and sesame street they were both founded on social and emotional learning they didn't call it that 50 years ago but when we look at it you know sesame street's mission is to be smarter, stronger, and kinder. If we can base it in those three core values and to understand, are we seeing mm. kindness today? Are we seeing wisdom today? Well, sometimes we're seeing some strength, but to start to base it 
in some of those basic core values. I think that that's really important. Uh, I am a huge fan of taking things that are very, very big and distilling them into something that is very, very digestible. So when I say that, children's books, simple children's songs, things like that that can say a huge message without using a lot of words. <clears throat> I'm a huge fan of. At the college level, you know, when I go into my music ed classes, I start every day with a children's book. For 18 to 22 year olds, whenever I go out and do professional development, I read children's books because those messages are digestible. It's understandable. So what I would suggest, we don't never want to condescend, but I would suggest thinking about ways that do embrace humanity, that get to the heart of what we're talking about without getting into partisan, uh, as, as Jason says, partisanship, because we need to understand that that's going to be more divisive. If we start to talk about what is our commonality and understand what is bringing us together, then we have a space to be able to start a conversation, even if we're going to end up differing in some fine points. Because of the content that we deal with on a regular basis, I really think it's important to realize that because of that content, uh, music supervisors or art supervisors are pretty well qualified to deal with these emotions. And so they should really step up to the plate, take care of business and not be afraid to talk about it with others and talk about it with students. Yeah, Scott, I, and 100% Gary. Oh, sorry, Rick, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I love what you said earlier about the needs. Needs sometimes are more important than the notes. And so if you get to a situation where you need to have difficult conversations with your students and you make time for that, how do you how do you uh, how do you set that up in your classroom so that uh, kids are comfortable sharing? And then, you know, you are, you're always going to have Johnny who goes run, running home and tells mom, you won't believe what we talked about in band today. And then how, how do you kind of address those kinds of things? Yep. So two, two really big questions there. And I'm going to kind of go with what, what Gary said. And I, I firmly believe, Gary, that you're right, that our subject matter is inherent and it has fertile ground to be able to talk about these things. But I do tend to avoid this idea that we already do this, that we as band directors and music teachers already do this. We do this if we do it with intentionality. We do this if we embed it into our content so that it is musical and we're building these life skills through our musicianship. And we do it if it's sustained, if we do it with that intentionality that we think about it on an ongoing basis. So to go to Rick's point, you know, how do we, and, and what this really is getting at is trust. How do we provide a space where students feel safe to be vulnerable and have these conversations? <clears throat> and the gist of it really does come down to, we demand vulnerability in the music classroom anyway. There is no place to hide in our music classroom. You know, if you don't, if you play a wrong note, the whole world's gonna know it. Or if you don't play, the whole world's gonna know that too. Vulnerability, if we become metacognitive on that and say, you know what, we're asking you to put yourself out there. Now we're adding a layer. Um, the gist of what we're talking about now is that students want to talk about these things, but they don't have the vocabulary to do so. And that's where SEL can be a very, very uh, strong tool to facilitate some emotional vocabulary so that we can talk about these emotions. And, you know, if you go into a conversation tomorrow and say, you know, how do you feel about yesterday? You know what? When we did that waterfall, we got some pretty good answers. But students sometimes know that they're having some... Yeah, da, 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 da. Uh, uh, students know that they're, they're bringing things into the classroom, but they don't have the words. That's what is our job to teach. Now, the, the tricky question here is that we are slowly building culture. We're slowly building culture where our classrooms are safe space to not only build musical competency, but social and emotional competency. The good news is, Rick, that a lot of this is being debunked on a daily basis, that our districts are getting on board and they're saying that this is an important part of our educational system and that we know that the teachers who are doing it organically in our classrooms are able to make this connection to our students at a far greater level than say a counselor. They trust the music teachers. We know music teachers are being asked to be counselors, whether that ha feels comfortable or not. So we're already being asked to do this. What I'm suggesting now 
is that we're positioning ourselves in a space that we do it inherently musically. And we're able to build these skills in a way so that we, when we have these conversations that it feels musical. I also encourage communication. You know, um, the other, uh, yeah, you know, I teach college, so it's a little bit different ball game. Um, but there's some pieces in the past that I've said, you know, we're gonna dig into this. <clears throat> and I just send a quick note home to the parents. Um, I also inform the students, uh, something called a trigger warning, that I'm going to be talking about some of these things. We're going to be exploring these things. Um, and I really just understand that this might be a sensitive subject for some people. At that point, I do bring in our mental health professionals and just say, you know what, just so you know, we're going to be talking about some of these things. They're supportive. They understand that it's important. The biggest challenge that we're going to have moving forward is to get our students from the trauma that we're experiencing now. And we say trauma, we're experiencing trauma from today, trauma from the pandemic, trauma from the racial inequality uh, that we're seeing in our country to get them back to trust and to trust that we're going to need to take some baby steps. So I don't recommend going in and saying, hey, let's talk about this. Well, let's use music as an entry point. Um, you know, we've heard John Lewis's name thrown around a lot as of late, and we just lost him. And he was famous of saying that the civil rights movement without music would have been like a bird without wings. Well, we need to use music. We need to use music to have those wings, to have these conversations. When we do that, then we're music teachers. And that's how that goes back to the parents. And we say, you know what? We're teaching music. You know, you you said something about about the uh, the trauma response, and and I'm going to talk in a few minutes about this 23rd and tell you a little bit more about that. But interestingly enough, you haven't talked to Shirley Doherty. She's one of our presenters for the 23rd, and the topic of her session is trauma response. <laughs> we're not we're not calling it that, but that's what it is. You know, Peter and, and Peter mentioned in his in his comment that that administrators are in the middle in terms of dealing with conflict and changing messages from everywhere. Do you have any advice for how to, or, or tools that they can use to be flexible in dealing with these changing messages? Because so many times administrators get caught in the middle. They're the messenger to the students, I mean, to the teachers that of the, of the information that's coming from above that shifts by the hour. How do we help our administrators, a, survive, and B, do a better job of keeping teachers off the ledge? Yeah, it's the million-dollar question, Nola. Uh, I want to go back for one second and just talk about trauma-informed because, you know, we're getting dangerously close to just calling this session buzzword, right? So we, we have SEL, we have trauma-informed, we have mindfulness. We could talk about this all day, and it's just buzzwords. Um, the thing about trauma-informed is trauma-informed and non-trauma-informed, there's no such thing as non-trauma-informed anymore. Everything that we're doing now has to be trauma-informed because we are experiencing universal trauma. So we're either helping or we're hurting. So the fact that you're putting that out there is critical. And trauma-informed fits in under the umbrella of social and emotional learning, of how do we respond. And, and I see trauma-informed and SEL more as the verb, okay? It's the how we're doing something. It doesn't change the what. The what is still music. The how gives us some insight, gives us a lens. So to, to talk a little bit about how do we remain flexible, the answer with anything when we're flexible is to not be so rigid that we're locked in. You know, today I could have said, OK, Nola, I'm going to come in and I'm going to stick to this. I'm going to stick to this. You like my prop? I brought it out like four times um, and we, we go. Um, but that's rigidity. And when we have rigidity, we're putting boxes up. Um, the challenge for us as I, I'm. I'm going to use a term that I, I don't mean to have the implication that it's going to middle people. You know, we're in the middle of different levels of administrations and then going into our, our teachers. The challenge with that is we have we, we are helpless largely from what is coming down. And we have uh, an obligation to serve the needs of those who are uh, looking up to us for guidance. The challenge is those two sides require different strategies. The strategy going up is to over communicate that, you know, um, you know, Gary, you and I were talking about our dear friend, Bob Morrison, and, you know, he's famous for saying uh, the first three things you need to do to talk to an administrator is to 
talk to an administrator today, talk to an administrator today, and talk to an administrator today. <clears throat> That's what you need to do. We need to get in on the ground route, especially as we're talking about some of the challenges that we're seeing about having to advocate for our programs moving forward to think about what we need to do to ensure that we're not going to have losses from uh, a fiscal crisis that is going to be coming as a result of the pandemic. So <clears throat> the first thing that I would suggest is while we are caught in the middle and Peter, I empathize up one side and down the other for what, what you're talking about here is to be on the front end of communicating so that we're not caught unaware, that we're not caught saying this is coming down and imposed upon us. If I communicate, I still may not like the answer, but then I know that I've done my due diligence. And then I can go back to my teachers and say, you know what? I fought. I fought. And this is where we are needing to go with this. And then for our teachers, the same thing. It's all about voice and choice. You've heard that. That's a mantra that's really, really powerful. But we need to provide a space that amplifies those that we are serving. So can we amplify our teacher's voice so that we can listen and then communicate that up? Oftentimes, I think that we see ourselves as administrators. You know, I'm music department chair at the college, and I see myself as the person who has to have all the answers. And oftentimes, that's because of time. Oftentimes, that's because of just some kind of false sense of pressure I put upon myself. And the answer is, every time that I take a step back and ask more questions, I come out better than when I went into that conversation and I've revised a draft and I've been able to put things together in a way that are going to be more meaningful to both sides. So while I'm in the middle going up and going down and then you know what? Who's going to hurt in the end if we don't have communication going all the way? The students, because they're going to be taught by teachers who feel like they're being forced into pressure situations. You're not going to be able to help your uh, teachers from a mentorship role. And then the people who are above the district administrators who are giving you so many conflicting advice, they are, are building the plane as they're going down the runway too. No one knows anything. And the answer to me uh, for all of this is to acknowledge that we are trying to facilitate the best educational opportunities for our students. You know, I've seen so many things on uh, on social media saying, you know what? Online remote instruction is not good. We need to get back into the classroom. And the first thing out of my mouth is, well, duh, not that we need to get back into the classroom, but that no one thinks that remote is better than in person. The second that we think that, you know, we that, that that's just a fallacy. The answer is we're doing the best with the cards that we've been dealt in the way that prioritizes physical safety, emotional safety, and social safety. So Stacy talks about that tricky part of I fought, you know, how it's, it's difficult to, to, to fight for teachers without setting it up as an us versus them mentality against the board, whatever the board is, you know, you got any, any sage wisdom about that, how to avoid that us versus them mentality and get us all in the same ship. You know, the, the answer for me always comes down to the kiddos. It always comes down to what is best for the students. And the second that we say I, then that that's probably the wrong mindset. And, you know, the fact, Stacey, you wrote the tricky piece of the I fought narrative. And I know I said that uh, just a second ago, and, and I, I totally get it. The, the, the fact that we're saying I, the second we say that, it, it's not I. Um, and, and one thing that I want to stress, and I, I meant to say a little bit earlier, that whenever we're having these conversations and whenever we're having these difficult discussions about how do we navigate the board or the administrator and not throwing people on the bus, this can never be something that we're doing to people. This can never be something that we're talking to people. It always has to be we're talking with people. And this is something that we're shifting gears with in the SEL field. It used to be thought that social emotional learning was something we do two students, that we do two students and you magically build these skills. Well, no one likes to have things done to them. No one likes to have things being forced upon them. The second that we take a step back and say, this is something we're doing with you, that we are doing, so we are co-creating. <clears throat> you know, I think the idea of co-creation is incredibly important. We talk about creativity, the root of that being to create. If we can co-create what we're able to do, bring me the limitations. Give me concrete ideas of what I can do. Where's my box? And then we're music teachers. I can come up with the best possible solution within that construct. 
That's what I'm talking about here. And it doesn't mean that we need to have all the answers. It means that our teachers need to have an amplified voice to be able to advise, to help, to construct, to create. And our students need to come up and advise the teachers. And then collectively, it becomes more of an ecosystem, it becomes more of a community as opposed to distinct layers. That's some great advice. I know, I know we've all heard that done too, and but it's one of those things that in the heat of the moment, we sometimes forget, don't we? You know? And the co-create is a, is a great... I don't want to say buzzword because we're eschewing those tonight. We're, we're shifting here. Oh, no, let's just embrace them. Okay. Call them what they are. And yeah, yeah. You left out unpacked on the list, by the way, because I oh, will we'll unpack that on the 23rd. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I have a, I have a personal question. I saw, I saw a book that somebody read recently and it, and I, you know, we all have so many things we want to read right now in limited time, but has any, it, anyone on this call, have you read the book Crucial Conversations? I haven't read it, but I saw it and it really piqued my interest. Um, and it, it, it's a, it's a, it's multiple authors and I don't want to put you on the spot, but the, it, but I thought surely out of 30, maybe someone had seen it. Crucial conversations, tools for talking when the stakes are high. Yes or no. Should I put that on my 2021 list? Okay. Maybe I'll read it and come back and uh, report out. Oh, amazing book. So people have read it. Okay. Nola, it sounds like a book club. It sounds like it sounds like one week. Just the title, I thought, you know what? That's relevant right now. <laughs> Jason, if Jason says it's a fantastic book, then I'm, yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll definitely download that puppy tonight. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else for, for Scott? Questions, comments? I see a lot of you've read it. Great. All right. Uh, Nola, can I just have two seconds? I want to respond to Peter, something that Peter put in the in, in the chat about this trifecta of pandemic, civil rights challenges in the economy. You know, it's an ugly situation. And, and Peter, what you put here is so profound when you say that the typical response is anger. And I just want to suggest that we see so much anger in our world today. We saw so much anger literally today and then just more broadly in our world currently. But what I'm going to suggest is that anger is the presenting emotion, <clears throat> that that is what we are seeing on the surface, that's what we're seeing on the news, that we are seeing as the manifestation of so many other emotions that are underneath that iceberg. What is often there is anxiety, is fear. And if we really look at this idea of hate, which we're seeing as a uh, just, just such a profound presence these days, that uh, hate, is at the intersection of fear and anger, that we can't hate something that we aren't afraid of. So when we start to see what is presenting and start to unpack those other emotions, that's when we are able to start to figure out the root, start to figure out not saying we're punishing the action, saying our job as teachers, our job as mentors, our job as humans, is to come to grips with those roots and to understand what are those underlying emotions that are creating anger and creating hate at the tip. We oftentimes think that hate is at the root and it's not. Yeah, that anger piece is huge. John Struby's talk, it's about something else. If you can get to the root of where the anger's coming from, a lot of times it's something completely different, you know, and that's all part of that relationship building that, that Gary Markham taught me the first conversation we ever had about it I said what is what is it that I need to know and he said it's a it's the job is all about relationships you know so life is all about relationships it's about who you bring with you it's about the people that you surround yourself with and do they make you a better version of yourself or a worse version of yourself you know Scott the the very first word I typed in when we did that exercise was I was angry and I thought no, I prob probably I probably shouldn't be angry. I'll just be disappointed instead. Now it's okay to be angry, so I'm good. I'm, I'm, yeah, I was angry. You know what? Validating your anger, Rick, absolutely. It's okay to be angry with this, but the disappointment, the potential fear, the potential anxiety, the potential unknown. Unknown, oh man, that's a huge one. And how does un uncertainty affect so many different emotions? And oftentimes, what happens when I'm feeling uncertain? Well, do my patients come down? 
hundred percent. You know, am I a little bit more apt to have extreme emotions? A hundred percent on both sides. So, and one quick point when we talk about that, you know, think about extreme emotions that we're seeing right now. I don't ever like to, for us to think, Rick, about having uh, positive or negative emotions. Anger is a validated emotion. And I like for us to think of it in terms of up emotions or down emotions and those up or down emotions being on a continuum of uh, intensity. So it might be anger. Well, let's ramp that up. Rage. Okay. So, or anger irked. Okay. So th there are a lot of different places that we can go, but to do so, we need to have an emotional vocabulary to unpack that. And once we are able to talk with those words, then we can understand, well, Rick, are you angry or are you disappointed? And there's probably a little bit of both, but then we can start talking about this. I'm writing down emotional vocabulary as you speak. <laughs> Anything else for Scott? Well, I just don't know that, I don't, I don't know how it happened that we had you for tonight, but I'm, I know, I think I can speak for the rest of us that this was a breath of fresh air that we all greatly needed. This community has, has uh, it's great to, be, I, I can't imagine a group of people that any of us probably needed to be with more tonight with, based on what we faced and, and what we're facing tomorrow and the next day and the next day. But, but the work that you do does matter and you're lifting people around you and ultimately it does get to the children. And that's sometimes really hard for us to remember. No, can I just say one thing about that? Please, that, going. you yeah. know, I, I know this is a, a parent that when I'm stressed, our four-year-old does not behave the same way. We start to see him act out. And in the moment, I'm not self-aware enough to know, well, it's my stress that's manifesting in him. But you know it, when we're showing stress, that our teachers are going to feed off of that. And when our teachers show stress, that the our students are going to feed off of that. Now, a caveat with this. This doesn't mean that we sugarcoat and pretend that we're not stressed. This means that it's okay to go into a conversation and say, you know what? I'm not okay. Today's been a rough day. Today's been stressful. I'm stressed. That's okay to say. The second that I do that, then I'm normalizing this idea that it's okay for you to be stressed. It's okay for you not to be perfect. And then we are embracing, hey, hey Nola, here's another buzzword, growth mindset, where we're able to say that it's not finite where I am right now that I'm progressing through this. Yeah. The pain is in the struggle, but without the struggle, there's no, there's not growth. Yeah. That's great. So I've seen some great comments coming in from Scott. I, th I think you were, I think you were a hit Scott. I think th <laughs> the responses are, are very positive and we're, and we're so we're, I think we're collectively grateful. Um, before we leave, I'm, I'm going to, uh, change the subject quickly for just a minute. If you, when Scott was referring to the 23rd, what we've been doing for the last several years, and this was Rick Ganelli's mind, uh, a brilliant idea. I think several years ago, uh, we worked in collaboration with NAM at the NAM conference in January. And not all of us are lucky enough to get to attend NAM every year, certainly. Uh, and it was highly attended by California arts administrators where they did a day of music administration and collaborative at the NAM. Gary, that was one of the three, the Midwest, the one in the summer at Con Selmer, and then the one in cooperation with NAM. Y'all were doing that before I came onto the scene, but we've, we've now shifted that partnership a little bit to the Southern California School Band and Orchestra Association. So on the 23rd, they're having their conference and because it's virtual, they've asked us to do the music administration collaborative on that day as well. And it'll start at 915 Pacific time and end at 315 Pacific time. I think Elisa's gonna put some information up on the screen. Um, but if, if or you can look in the if you click on this Sam Cart page, you'll see you can see that what it is in here. But the presenters that we have. Um, the fabulous Scott Edgar, who's going to do more. Dr. Tim will be with us. Shirley Doherty, who's a marriage and family specialist, will be talking about leadership and the intersection of stress and reaction, and that's re trauma response. Laurie Shell is going to do a joint session with the teachers and the music administrators, arts administrators, about advocacy being personal. 
um, and she's, she and Bob Morrison have done a lot of work together on advocacy and uh, she's a terrific um, voice for that. And then of course, Scott, identity belonging and agency. And then uh, Leslie Johnson, if you haven't seen her or heard her, she's the executive vice president of the Scrub Off Center. And the subject of kind of the day, the theme of the day is going to be about intentional, about a tent. And um, so we kind of did a playoff of, of, in, of the word tent because it's an intentional and retention. So we know that you're worried about retaining your teachers. You know that teachers are worried about retaining their programs and their students. And we want to be intentional about it. So we're using that word tent. And it came from Kathy Leibinger, if you know Kathy, because she's teaching in a tent in South Florida and has been. <laughs> so we kind of riffed off of that because we're musicians and we need, you know, we need a motivic reference every now and then. So we hope you'll join us on the 23rd. You can register here. It's open. Registration is open for that. You will have access to um, view it on demand like Netflix for two weeks after. And um, so you'll be also getting it in the email tomorrow and it'll be on social media as well. Um, we, we want this Mercedes is asking, will there be another partnership with the Mac at a later date? Possibly. This is the only one we have on the calendar. Currently the, the things coming up for the Mac are this event on the 23rd, our first Wednesdays that we will continue at 6 PM Eastern time. And um, someone emailed me about that today. What we're trying to do is meet in the middle and make it not too late for the East Coast people and not too early for the West Coast people. And they're and everything's viewable afterwards. We're we're sending out the link to the review if you can't be with us. Of course, we would love to have you be with us when you can. But we'll continue to do these first Wednesdays, and then we'll do the Music Administration Collaborative for the Conselmer Institute Connect will be virtual again this summer. And that's, I'm pretty safe in saying you can reserve that weekend of June, week of June the 16th, 14, 15, 16 is when that's gonna be. It's not in stone, but it's it's in pretty indelible ink at this point. And there'll be something rolling out about that in the next week or so. So that's where we are for our events that, that are coming up. But yeah, we're always open, Mercedes. The SES BOA people are great friends of ours and and uh, we, we love working with them. And if there's anything that we can do in your district to support the work you're doing with professional development, content specific, we can we can certainly provide that. Um, Gary, Rick, anything for the good of the order? I think we're good. I uh, wanna, again, thank everybody for being here and Scott in particular. And uh, we'll continue to work on and charge uh, charge ahead and be positive. Yeah, and we we definitely need to thank Mike Campis and, and Steve Zapp, our CEO, for continuing to support the Music Administration Collaborative. You know, in a pandemic and with the economy like it is, it would have been real easy to pull back the reins on this initiative. And instead, they're doubling down on this work because because they really know that, that your work is critical to the success of our profession. So we thank you, Scott, thank you so much. We just love you so much. Every time we're with you, I, I just feel the room, the shoulders go down and everybody exhales. And it may not last long, but, it's, but for this moment, I think you've given us a, a glimmer of hope that we all were just, just starving for tonight. I'm just gonna be very vulnerable. You know, I was nervous about this one. You know, I mean, this this is a tough day to do something like this and that makes it, that means it's that much more important. So Nola, Gary, Rick, thank you for the opportunity. It was an honor to be able to talk to everyone today. Cool, cool.